Jobs at NEF, the Women's Budget Group, and the Friedrich Ebert Stittung. Um, we on better social care. Um, we've got a fantastic of both speakers and hopefully time together uh, to discuss this absolutely critical issue. Now, my starting point for this is that look, we know the social care system is in crisis. And I think if we were in any doubt about the fact that the social care system is in crisis, the pandemic has shown this in spades um, and has exacerbated the problems that were there with the system. And for me, the problems stem and they're threefold. Uh, we have high and rising numbers of people that lack access to essential so, uh, care services. 1.5 million people aged 65 and over are estimated to have unkept care needs. For those unable to access uh, public support or pay for it themselves, an increasing number of people are reliant on family members in order to provide care with absolutely no support. The for those that can access the care system, uh, the quality of care is often too poor. It's dominated by a care model uh, that delivers restricted list of basic tasks to people in uh, with insufficient time to deliver it. And the sting in the tail for me is that for those that are working in the care system, for those that are providing absolutely vital work to care for us, to care for our loved ones, work that is incredibly valuable, we have a sector that provides jobs that are poorly paid, uh, that are increasingly insecure, uh, meaning the this, this sector has a high level of turnover um, and large numbers of vacancies. So we know we have a problem. We know that this problem is profound. Uh, we had a government that came in and said they were going to fix the care system once and for all. Uh, many of us may have been skeptical, but we, uh, we were encouraged and we were emboldened by this. And to be fair to the government, they have arguably done more than previous governments uh, in the last 30 years to try to begin to stem the crisis in social care by introducing new income stream into the care sector and by capping the care of costs. These are gains, these are gains in which we support, but they have shied away from the true scale and the challenge, uh, the scale of the challenge that the sector faces. The high level of the new care cap set at £86,000 means that it's likely to achieve the very limited goal that the government set itself of ensuring that no one will have to sell their homes to pay for care. And there are bigger issues with the care sector, whether it's the insecurity or low pay of the sector, whether it's the quality of provision, whether it's access, that the reforms of the government are muting and are talking about just go nowhere near solving. But there is hope. Uh, and the thing that we are arguing, the thing that the Women's B Budget Group is arguing, is actually the ambition of high quality universal social care, free at the point of view, need, there to meet need, is not a pipe dream. It is something that is attainable. It is something that we can aim for and we can achieve. And we are hoping to produce a, a report uh, in the next uh, few weeks that will be trying to insert this aspect into the debate that is often quite technocratic, that often takes the system that is it, as it is and assumes that we've got to modify within the constraints of a system that is failing and that's broken rather than looking at quite a radical alternative. You know, our view is that there are there is the opportunity to design a very different system. And we only have to look at what other countries and other parts of the world to give us a sense that there is a pathway that we can move towards. Um, we have the luxury and benefit of the fact that other countries have grappled with the crisis in social care. Other countries have put in place reforms that potentially we can learn, le learn lessons for when we're thinking about the scale of the challenge, the types of solutions that might provide us with this very basic, very basic need, which is care that is there for everyone that needs it when they need it. The aim of today is to start that conversation, uh, is to turn our minds across and look at what uh, colleagues in other parts of the world are doing, uh, to learn lessons about the reforms they put in place, uh, the things that worked, the things that they didn't work, and see whether that provides insights for us here in the UK. We've got an absolutely brilliant lineup of people um, to both stimulate us, to challenge us, to throw questions and ideas at us, and to hope uh, to spark what I hope will be a really fantastic conversation this morning. 
Uh, before I introduce our speakers and talk about the lineup that we have for the day, um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague and co-host Michelle to say a few words. Michelle, over to you. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much, Miata. I think you already uh, put the finger into the wounds and uh, let's see if we can have some healing here today. Um, I would just like to highlight the fact that Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, I know it's a very, very complicated name and we already talked about pronunciation this morning and thank you, 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 you bravely did very well. <laughs> so Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is close to the social democratic movement in Germany and which has just recently celebrated a huge comeback in the winning of the federal elections. Maybe you heard about it. I'm highlighting this because the discussion about the crisis of social care is a crisis of the role of the state. And therefore, to me, it is very closely linked to the question of democracy and whether our model of democracy is actually able to deliver what it has promised. One main reason for the success of the Social Democratic Party of Germany lately was that a large group of formerly non-voters, 1.25 million, um, million people who had abandoned the SPD, they came back to the polls, they felt they could vote again for the SPD. This had not been the case in three previous elections, and it was only possible because the SPD had changed its program with regards to social care. The SPD could regain credibility while adopting a new social care program that would center around the people who need it and around the word respect. The, the SPD proposed replacing the intimidating and sanctioned tight hearts fear unemployment benefit. This program had been controversially introduced by the last center-left government under Chancellor Gerhard Schröder. Now, the party manifesto had proposed a new, less distrustful welfare program called Citizens' Money. In the campaign, they recognized the value of physical forms of labor, a higher minimum wage, and better wages for carers. And this commitment, among other elements in the party manifesto, attracted enough voters to bring the SPD back in power. And there's a good chance that the new government can implement the biggest part of this party manifesto, by the 6th of December, we should have a new government and a new chancellor called Olaf Scholz. So I'm not, I'm not trying to make a campaign here. Election day is over. The point I'm trying to make is that it actually does um, make a difference whether you care about the care sector or whether you don't. Thank you so much. So high quality universal social care. Um, is it attainable? Is it within our grasp? Can we achieve it? Uh, our firm view is that it is. Um, but to do that, we've got to confront the big funding questions. Um, we, the analysis that we've done with the Women's Budget Group suggests that if we put an extra 20 billion per year into the system, this is within our grasp. Um, but this is a much, much bigger funding ask uh, than the one that the government has committed to um, at 1.8 billion a year from 2024 onwards. So we are in no doubt um, about the challenge um, in building political consensus for this scale of investment. But I think the core argument for us is that this investment will not only deliver um, a core basic service, which quite frankly should be a right for every single citizen, but more profoundly, it will have huge knock-on effects upon our economy and our society, whether that's by creating better paid jobs across the care sector, by the way, jobs that are low carbon will always be part of our future, whether by having an impact on uh, poverty, um, particularly uh, amongst women and people of color who disproportionately make up the care sector, or by freeing up people who at the moment have caring responsibilities and have to juggle the difficulties of that with work with free time. There are huge benefits that go beyond the service, and we think that the case can be made. Um, the question for us is, can we build the political will? Can we create a debate that wins public support and consensus for this absolutely vital services? Um, and we hope that this is be the beginning of that debate and that conversation. 
We've got about a couple of hours uh, this morning um, and we're going to break it up into two parts. So we're going to hear from our panelists and I'll introduce them in a moment. They will give us insights from different countries that have approached this perennial and difficult challenge in different ways. But through that, have come up with systems that we think that we can learn from. Uh, we'll allow a little bit of time after we've heard from all of our speakers uh, for questions and answers. I think if colleagues in the room want clarifications, if they want to probe, if they want to find out more, we'll create the space to do that. Um, and then we'll break out into virtual rooms. I'm very excited about this plot, uh, play, uh, point because the technology is fantastic, but we will be able to sit around tables that we will sort of set you um, and allocate to you uh, in order to have a conversation about what we've heard, uh, what we've learned, the insights we think that it brings. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about how you can move around tables uh, when we get to it. Um, we'll come back together just to reflect. Um, and I'll ask some colleagues to provide some insights and some reflections on what they've heard, and then we'll wrap up uh, for the morning. Um, so a, a fantastic lineup um, set up for us. To kick us off, um, I'm going to uh, turn to Professor Naoki uh, Kigami, uh, who has written extensively about the long-term care insurance model implemented in Japan since 2000. Um, and I'm incredibly excited uh, to both welcome in here, but to hear uh, what we can learn from the Japanese example. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, first of all, uh, may I have the first slide? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have chosen to see this perspective as long-term care services and not as social care, because social care gives a connotation that it's more of a government service. Uh, in fact, it is not, and, um, at least not in Japan. And I will begin by defining what are long-term care services. They are personal care, um, body touch services, such as assistance in bathing, grooming, walking, and eating. And these are referred to as activities of daily living assistance. The other services, household chores, that are not, not no body touch, but uh, meal preparation, cleaning, shopping, medication management. And these are referred to as uh, instrumental ADL assistance. They also include home modification, lamps and uh, handrails, and also an emergency alert systems and also transport to healthcare and long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes. But it generally excludes services by doctors, except when the doctor is employed by the long-term care facility. So the, the next slide, please. And uh, if we contrast long-term care with healthcare, this gives uh, an idea of the problems we face when we try to finance it. Because the extent of government responsibility in healthcare, it is to provide equal access to virtually all services. That is not the situation in long-term care. It is to provide a decent level of service however decent is going to be determined. And the decisions for making, uh, for choosing the service or starting the service, in healthcare, it's a doctor who does so. But in long-term care, it is a recipient because it is based on their personal needs. In, in all, all countries, most, care services or long-term care is provided by the family. And if the person doesn't have a family or the family is not capable, then that is where formal services come in. So it's not like a healthcare where it is outside the daily life. And these services are 
also differ by who delivers the services. In healthcare, it is a licensed professionals, doctors, nurses, and physiotherapists. And they have licenses to ensure they have met the qualifications and have undergone the uh, training to provide the service. But in long-term care, it is a family who provides most of the services and there's a limited role of professionals. And that is the basic problem that uh, with professionals, those who have licenses, they can say, you cannot do it because you don't have the qualifications and only we nurses, doctors can provide the service. And therefore, we, you have to pay us to provide the service. But if you, in the long-term care area, the care worker is in many cases substituting the family. And since the families do not have a license, do not need or are, are asked to have a license to care for the family member. Therefore, the care worker, although as, as food, may work as full-time workers, nevertheless, they do not require a, a qualification process. And th the fact that they do not require a formal qualification process, uh, maybe a short-term training, this means that they cannot have a close market for their labor, which means that it's difficult to pay them enough. And that is why we have a chronic shortage of care workers. It is not because there are not enough workers willing to pay, but they are not willing to pay enough so that more would come in as carers. So th that is the basic difference between healthcare and long-term care. The next slide, please. So there, there are key policy decisions for long-term care. For the government, it is, shall we restrict it only to the poor? Second, poor as a primary target, but to include non-poor. And third is new universal standards. Non-poor have equal rights to services. That is why I prefer to call it long-term care. Regardless of income, they have a right to for the long-term care services. The should services be limited by budget or should they benefits be an entitlement? Entitlement means a guaranteed individual right. In tax-based system, such It is an individual entitlement. They have a right to the service. The third question is, should services be focused on heavy care or should right care be included? Or in other words, should it be limited to those who are virtually bedridden or should services be also available who have some difficulty in walking and may require assistance to go shopping? But uh, should those also be have a right to services too? And so it's difficult to set a, a cutoff point. And the next part, I will describe how we try to solve this issue in Japan. The, the development of long-term care in Japan, uh, you may be surprised that we have a long-term care insurance system because Japan is known for its Confucian tradition 
Their children are expected to care for their parents. And the eldest son and, and his wife, the spouse, had the primary responsible. Uh, and so there was no need for almhouses for the poor. Institute, the first institutional care facility for elders was established in 1929 for the three no's, no money, no home, no family. This was reformed in the Elders Welfare Act in 1963 when, and when no money is no longer a condition for obtaining services, but it de facto focused on the poor, similar to the situation we have in England. The next slide, please. But uh, long-term care in Japan came in through the healthcare system, because uh, when free medical care for elders, be before that, they had to pay 30 to 50% of the costs of the care. But in 1973, it became free for all elders over the age of 70. And the number of elders who were hospitalized in patients increased 20 times in 20 years. And uh, we reinvented the long-stay hospitals for elders and the, the, the quality of care was poor and there was over-medicalization. So before long-term care insurance, there was long-term care in long-term care hospitals, which is inexpensive, inappropriate. The other beginning of long-term care in Japan was the what we call the gold plan. This was a government program to expand so from 1989. The ruling party wanted to gain women's votes and they were very blatant about this. And there was a 10 year plan launched with high targets which were generally met. For example, day services, day service facilities multiplied 10 times in 20 years, but uh, services continue to be focused on the poor and you have to go to the local authority office and ask for the service and wait in line until they provide it to you. So on one hand, we had uh, long stay hospitals in healthcare. On the other hand, on the other hand, we had these uh, social services which were rationed by the local authority office. Next slide. So the people felt that the both the health medical services and social services have failed to provide good long-term care. And the decision was made to start a long-term care insurance program that was similar to health insurance in 2000, in which long-term care services were made an entitlement that, that is regardless of income or family support, services were available. And in healthcare services and uh, social services were combined under the long-term care insurance. And those covered were the elderly and uh, those 40 to 64 who ha had uh, age-related diseases. And they were managed by the municipalities. That is, the insurance premiums levied from those living in that municipality basically financed the services. The 80% was the rest of the, the premiums paid by those 65 and over finance 20%, the remaining 80% came from central government taxes and other social insurance. The next slide, please. 
so these were financed by half by taxes and half by premiums. And the generous levels of entitlement uh, only services, no cash. For home care, there were seven levels which gave them a, a voucher, a, a de facto voucher to purchase long term care with services up to the amount to 2,000 pounds per month. And these were based on the eligibility levels. That is the amount of ADL and IADL support that the person needs. And not the income or the amount of family support had no relation to the uh, entitlement level. The next slide, please. So, so uh, the flow chart for receiving long-term care services, you apply to the municipal office, the eligibility level of seven levels amount of care that you require. And then once this is decided, you select the care manager and the care manager um, purchases the services for you. Um, the role of care managers are this is a person who purchased the services based on the care plan that, that they draw based on the needs and the wishes of the client. Uh, I'll skip the details for the interest of time. So next slide, please. So see that the next slide, please. You see, there has to be a rapid growth for long-term care insurance. Our population of those 65 and over has increased by 1.4 times. At present, 28% of the population is 65 and over. So yes, so the, the, the elderly population has increased, but the number of who have been certified as eligible has increased three times. And the service users have also increased by three times. The premiums that finance it, the building blocks to, for the services have increased twice. And long-term care expenditures have increased three times. So the final remarks, next slide, please. Long-term care is different from healthcare. Government is responsible for providing a decent level, not the best level of services. Long-term care insurance had to continue providing the same level of services that had been available in healthcare and in social services before its implementations. Expenditures have tripled since 2000, but people are more willing to pay long-term care insurance premiums than taxes. Okay. Finally, government has announced care workers' wages will be increased 3% for their work during COVID-19. So uh, my time is up. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Naraki. That was absolutely fascinating. I think the thing that struck me is the similarities of the challenges we face here and the challenges that you faced in Japan. I think it was fascinating to hear the evolution of the long-term care system, uh, particularly on eligibility and the shift from uh, based on income, uh, focus on the poor to based on your kind of care needs. Um, and I think there's a lot for us to learn about that blended funding model, um, both uh, provision, but also uh, through insurance. So lots to kind of chew on and build on. Um, I'm going to uh, move on uh, for us to take another insight from uh, another uh, country. Uh, next up is Marta uh, Sebahe, uh, who again has done huge amounts of uh, work uh, on social care in Sweden. Um, she is a professor in social work at the Stockholm University. Um, and I'm again excited to uh, hear your insights um, about what we can learn about the system that has been developed there. So thank you very much. I will try to share my slides to see whether I can get it working. I'm not entirely sure, but we'll have a go. Let's see. Share. So what happens? 
Do you, do you see it or not? Do you see my slides? I think. Okay, so let's have a go. And see if I can. Just let me know if it doesn't work. So thank you very much. So are there any lessons to learn from Sweden? Well, I think I will start with one of my my uh, any, uh, uh, a message that I have really been stressing with, uh, during all my entire life as a researcher. We have to think about long term care services as part of a society's social infrastructure. So because it deals with the risk related to both needing care and giving care. So there are three parties involved. You have the person who needs care. You have their families who might or might not provide care. And you have paid care workers if you have care, paid care work, which of course is not entirely, uh, it's not always the case. So that means that the care services, they are important for the society as a whole. They are not only important for the person who, are, who is using the services here and now. It's like roads or railroads. They are important for the whole society, even those when we don't need them or use them for this very moment. Uh, and therefore, this is my message to local politicians all the time, we can't just talk about long-term care services at just an expense. I don't, I, I don't use the investment rhetoric because I don't think we can talk about investment, but it's really social infrastructure. So that, that's, therefore, we need to pay for care services. So, and there is also a very strong correlation, or there is at least a correlation. Uh, the more formal care services there is in long-term care services there is in a, a country, there is also higher labor force participation among middle-aged women, because that is the age group and gender group who actually do a lot of, of uh, the actual care. So if you have on, on the y-axis here, we have the labor force participation among women 55 to 64 years old. And on the x-axis, we have the uh, one measure of, of, the, of the size of the care workforce. It's the number of formerly employed care workers per 65 plus in the population, the percentage of that. So we can see that we have the uh, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, they are high on uh, how, how, my, how much care, care workers, how many care workers there are in the population, but also high on labor force participation. Then we can see the UK is in the middle. Uh, so long-term care services, they facilitate for middle-aged women and men to be in paid work, and therefore they can pay tax. So if you have more tax, you can also have more publicly funded services. So hopefully this is one message I want to get start with. And I think you might know that we have the, this equality ambition in Swedish in, in, in policies of universalism. There is a clear equality ambition in the long-term care policies. So the idea is that we, have, we offer high quality services that are directed to and used by all social groups. And the idea was when, when these services started in the 1950s was that we should have the same services for all social groups because that would improve the quality for all. We have this concept of the people's home, Swedish social democracy in the 1950s, and with this quote that only the best is good enough for the people. So the idea is that the, the middle class and poorer group would use the same services, then it would improve the quality of the services also for those with few resources. It's kind of the sharp elbows of the middle class. And of course, this was a period that we had a more homogeneous society than we have now, but, we had, but still have very large class differences. And therefore, it should be there, not therefore, not there. So therefore, uh, also in this period, uh, it, services should be not only publicly funded, they should also be publicly provided because that was the only possibility to guarantee that it would be high quality services for all. In the 1990s, we had a trend of marketization inspired by UK among other countries. So we, it's not really the case today. So today we have like 20% of our services are uh, for, provided by for-profit uh, companies. And I, I will not go into that detail un un unless you ask me about it. But we have still high taxation. We have the taxation-based system in contrast to the Japanese in a way. And we still have a comparatively generous provision of services and we have low user fees. And but I want to stress that formal eligibility is not enough. So services have to be accessible. You have to have uh, generously provided services. They have to be affordable also for the poor, but they have also to be attractive. They have to be high quality. Otherwise people who have other 
alternatives will choose not to choose not to use them. So to keep the support of the middle class, services have to be of so high quality so they are attractive also for them. And therefore, universal services have to be individually adapted. One size doesn't fit all. And I want to give an example of the home care services when they started to be built up in the 1950s, because that is a good example of an individually adapted but universal welfare services. And it grew very rapidly. It increased from 60,000 users in 1960 to 250,000 users in 1980. We are a small country, so numbers doesn't really is not so important, but the growth is important. This is a more rapid growth than any other welfare service in, in our system. So it was also the first universal services that was actually reached out to all social groups. And therefore, it was very important in changing the general view of the welfare state, because it was a service that was attractive, uh, accessible and affordable. For general state subsidies, users have paid a, a user fee, but it was affordable. And it was attractive because it made it was possible for the care workers to provide individually and situationally adaptive care. And there were some really important organizational preconditions for that. And there are still these those preconditions that we have to have if we want to provide good care. So they have, they have to be enough time in the encounter. They have to be continuity. You can't have too many uh, care recipients to relate to. You can't have too many care workers to relate to if you're a care user. And the care workers need to have sufficient freedom of action to see what's happening when they see the client and, and adapt what they want to, what they do to what the, care, what the client needs and wants in this particular moment. And that was the case in the 50s, 60s and 70s, a bit into the 80s also. Uh, but care workers had low pay and they had little support from managers and from professionals, other kinds of professionals. And that is still the case, which has been quite a lot criticized more recently. But these equality ambitions in legislations, they are still unchanged. But we have seen tightened public funding. And I, as, as I noticed that uh, the previous speaker uh, said that uh, if you have a tax based system, it is budget, uh, it is restricted by budget. And we can definitely see that. So we have seen reduced service coverage in Sweden. We have also very strong aging in place policies. So we have seen a very, actually, the, the fastest decline in care homes in, in the OECD countries in Sweden. So we have seen. Uh, from 80% of 80 plus using uh, had a place in care home in, nine, in the year 2000, they are down to 11 or 12% today. It's still a reasonably high coverage, but it's, it's not particularly high. It's quite medium in the, in the European standard. And we have seen also that that has changed the, the, uh, the structure of home care. So those who are using home care have increasing care needs because they are no longer being cared for in, in care homes. And we have seen, as many other parts of the world, we have seen de-caring organizational trends inspired by new public management, and particularly home care has become increasingly predefined, standardized, and fragmented. Uh, care homes have been increasingly popular uh, when you have large care needs, uh, because they offer a combination of privacy, safety, and community. People want to go to care homes in Sweden, and it's, it's more a problem that you are not, you, there are not care homes. Uh, but the services both in care homes and home care are still affordable. We, there was a max fee reform introduced in 2001. So since then, no one would pay more than £180 per month for care, either in, at home or in a care home. You pay for uh, housing, you pay for food in a care home, but in, as you would do also at home. But for the care part, you would never pay more than £180 per month. And if you have a low income, you, you can be exempted from paying a fee. So there is, no, there is no strong incentive to refrain from using care on financial reasons, I would still say. And actually, people prefer still, even if we have seen some deteriorations of, this, of, of the quality of services, particularly in home care, uh, we can see, see, still see that people do prefer publicly funded care to both family care and to care services bought at the market. You are happy to, to receive help from your family with financial issues, for instance, but you don't want your family to come and do the cleaning for you or, or help you with the laundry and definitely not with personal care. That is the, the general uh, pattern. Of course, there are always exceptions for that. And family do provide a lot of care also in Sweden. Also, 
in, in care homes, actually. And again, there is a strong correlation between uh, the view of quali on quality of care and the willingness to use formal services. And this is from the, uh, so this shows in the, on the y-axis, the proportion who on a survey uh, say that they agree totally that care staff is doing an excellent job. I think it's strange that anyone can agree totally to such a, to such a statement, but obviously some people do. And the highest proportion are in, again in the Nordic countries. So, um, and on the y, sorry, in the x axis, we can see those who say that they would prefer services rather than family care for a dependent person. And again, we can see the UK in the middle here. And we have the Nordic Nordic countries up uh, high, both on, on how, how people view the uh, quality of services and the willingness to use services. So it really matters how accessible, affordable and attractive services are, whether people are willing to use them. So, But I would uh, say, end up by say, stating that the Swedish model is at a crossroads because we see uh, the funding is now less generous. Uh, but it's still generous in an international perspective. We do pay around 2.6% of our GDP for, for uh, services for older people. And services are still affordable, uh, but they have become less accessible, particularly care homes, and less attractive in home care. So I think the consensus now in Sweden is that we have to build more care homes again. So, and there are, so whether services are affordable, accessible and attractive, it's cru crucial uh, for, this, uh, for the survival of a universal model because the citizens need to trust that there will be good enough services when we, when we need them. Because otherwise we will search for private solutions, private, private funding solutions or private pro provision solutions. So, and those who can't afford it will have to rely increasingly on family. And we can see those trends, but there is still a strong support for, for uh, the public solutions. And if, if it, um, otherwise we will have a dual care system, I think it's familiar for many of you, where we can see uh, uh, some, uh, high, uh, some services that will, will be more expensive and provide really high quality services, uh, and be used by those who have a lot of resources and others will either have to rely on family care or uh, rely on services that are not as good because the middle class sharp elbows have disappeared from those services. But again, we still have a strong public support for public funded, publicly provided services. We have a willingness to pay tax and we still can see in the general population a passion for equality and quite a lot of skepticism to for-profit care, but that hasn't fully reached the politicians yet. They don't, haven't understood that there is a criticism of that among the general public. So my conclusion would be that this, our, our version of universalism, which is actually a weak universalism because it's not as universal as many other services because you always have to pass through a needs assessment process and the, how, how needs are defined varies over time, unfortunately. So, but still universalism is sustainable if citizens find it worth preserving and they would do it if, they, if, if services are there when you need them and if there are good enough quality of them so you can want to use them and you can afford them. So thank you. Stop there. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think those principles of affordability, accessibility and attractiveness, I think, are really important as we think about how you might design um, a system. Um, I think the thing that struck me from what you said was um, actually the, the sort of the equality ambition that was baked into uh, the, the sort of the premise of the system, high quality services that had to be used by all um, and therefore they had to be attractive services so that it appealed to middle classes. Um, I think the other thing that comes out is that uh, a, a model that is funded by taxation does have trade-offs because when public finances are tight, uh, there is a knock-on effect on services. Uh, but the piece that gives me such hope in terms of thinking about designing an alternative is that affordability principle. The idea of £180 a month um, is completely astounding given where we are, um, but definitely gives us a route uh, by which we might move forward. 
Thank you so much. I will hand over finally uh, to our uh, final speaker, Professor Heldegard uh, Theobald from the Department of Organizational uh, Gerontology at Vector University. Again, uh, has written extensively on social care system um, and the comparative context, uh, including Sweden and Germany. And you're going to provide us with some insights on the German model and what we might learn. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation first. Then I will wait for Daniel. He will share my, share slides. Thanks. Uh, welcome to my presentation on the long-term care insurance in Germany, which is the most relevant policy scheme in the area. The next slide, please, Daniel. In my presentation, I will give an idea about the situation before the introduction of long-term care insurance. Then I will show you our insurance and I will find finally close with a conclusion. The next slide, please. I will start with the situation before the introduction of long-term care insurance. The next slide. Even before our system of long-term care insurance, we had a scheme in place. It was a system to care scheme, which was introduced in 1962 within the federal social assistance law. I think it's comparable to Japan. Here, frail older adults could receive benefits after means test and if the family could not take over responsibility. And it was implemented on the local level with regard to assessment and the financing. The next slide, please. But demographic change, increase in care needs and financial difficulties question the policy scheme in place. I can summarize three strands of debate which end up finally with the introduction of long-term care insurance. First, it was the risk of, of impoverishment of frail older adults in residential care services. We have had a strong increase of public cost on the local levels. We have the finances cost, and we had a lack of home care, lack of home care services because if the family was not available, all the adults very quickly moved to residential care services. So based on these strands of debates, the goals of the new insurance scheme should be should be universal to risk to reduce the risk of impoverishment. We need a new financing scheme to reduce the public cost on the local levels and we had to strengthen care at home. The so next slide please. And I would like to show you our long-term care insurance which was introduced in 1995 and 1996. So next yes. the basic idea in Germany is it we have explicit familyism. That means we still want to have that family care is a cornerstone of care provision, but it should be publicly supported and complemented by care services. So we have now a universal system, including all ages. The generosity is more on a medium level because we have only fat rate benefits, which means that 30% of the, of the service costs have to be covered privately on average. This also is related to the threshold and the range of risk covers. We have a lot of types of benefits related to services and cash payments. I will show it on the next slide. And no, okay, okay, I can, it was too quick. And public financing is a mix of social and private insurances and assistance to care scheme we have not abolished. It's still available and is now complementing public support if the beneficiaries cannot take over the private cost on their own. Now the next slide. It looks a little bit complicated, but I will use it to show you here the benefits available in our scheme, which are stipulated by law, which are entitlements, and to show you also the different types of services available. After the assessment procedure in Germany, the beneficiaries are assigned to five levels of care decrees. Afterwards, they can choose if they want to have stay at home and use cash payments or home care or a mix of both, or if they want to move to residential care services. If they stay at home now, we have now improved our infrastructure, so all beneficiaries are entitled to day and night care services, respite short-term care services, and additional services more related to household services, but also to social services, then, then finally, I have to say the flat rate benefits are defined by the care decree and the type of services. So we have different flat rate benefits. But what's important is that the flat rate benefits does not cover the costs for our services. The so next slide. 
embedded in this framework, we have had a strong increase of coverage. If it takes the, the elder, older adults, 65 years plus, so you see we have in 1994, before the introduction, only 2.4% of all adults receive benefits. That is an increase to 1999 to 12%, and now after the most recent reforms to 18%. If you look at the structure, you see that cash payments are still relevant, but we have the strongest increase related to home care services or other services which are also related to home care. So we have in part a changed situation now related to the use of home care services. The so next slide, please. If you take now a look at the home care use, you have now about 44% of beneficiaries, almost half of them using services. Typically, they mix up different types of services related to professional services within the framework of long-term care insurance, but they also organize services on a gray market within the private households. All types of services, all types, also the public types are more often used by the middle classes and the people with lower income have difficulties to use these services because they can simply often not afford the private costs. So next slide, please. The private costs are also debate related to residential care services. We have had a steadily increase of the private costs and in 2019, the private costs for residential care services were about almost 2,000 euros a month. We have no adaptation to the financial situation of, of the beneficiaries. And so we have an increase of, of residents using again assistance to care benefit schemes. Now it's about 41% of the residents. This also impedes, of course, the use of residential care services. So next slide, please. Now I would like to show you the care services in Germany and that development. So next slide. In Germany, we have established a quasi-care market with introduction of long-term care insurance. Here we have accredited providers who, pay, who compete on prices and quality, and we have established a customer choice model. But we have also strict state regulation, and we have this public financing based on these flat rate benefits. The idea here was that we need an expansion of home care services based on the demand of the users, but we should also have cost control and there should be choice for the users. So next slide, please. We would like to show you what happened in the system. First, I can show you that we have had a strong increase or expansion of providers or the number of beds within both sectors. If you look at the agency of the providers, you see at the, be at the beginning, non-profit provision was the dominant form. Now, for-profit for provision has made an inroad into the, into the market, but still we have a mixed system. So still we have a lot of non-profit providers and for-profit providers, while public providers has always been not relevant in this area. So next slide, please. Now I would like to show you what does this mean for the care quality. If we look first at home care services, we can say that the basic services offers are available everywhere even we have less choice in rural areas. But we have still a lack of more specific offers, for example, geriatric rehabilitation or daycare services. As Daniel also described, the matter also said, uh, sales provision is very regulated and standardized. And we now used paid voluntary work in additional services to provide more social activities or more surveillance. The next problem is that we have a very fragmented infrastructure with these different types of services and it's sometimes confusing for the users. Next slide, please. If I come to the care quality in residential care services, it's also strongly regulated and this is mainly based on the care scandals. And we have comparably low person ratios. But we have structural improvements. So we have more assisted living facilities, we have independent care living communities, we have new care concepts in the facilities, and so on. But as Mada showed also, the German population is typically skeptical to use the use of residential care services. The so next slide, please. I would like to show a situation of the care workers. So next slide. 
Related to the expansion of the whole structure, we have, of course, all the expansion of the number of care workers. If you look at the skill levels in Germany, we have about 50% of care workers in both sectors having completed a three years occupational training program. The first of 50% have lower training levels. If you look at the working time arrangements, we have very widespread part-time work. And if a precarious work, it's mini jobs in Germany. <laughs> mini jobs are employment form which, um, which defined level of hours, but on low level of hours, low number of hours, up to wages of 450 euros per month. You see here is that it's more widespread in the home care sector than the residential care sector, and it's more widespread among for-profit providers than the other providers. The so next slide, please. If you look at the employment situation from the perspective of the wages, we have a big debate in Germany also on the wages. We have different wage levels related to skill levels. So I've shown it here, the most region wages. If you take the train elder carers, it's about, the medium is about 3,000 euros per month. If you take the assistance, it's about 2,200 euros per month. We do not only discuss the low wage, but also the wage differences because we have no general collective agreement. So we have very different wages related to regions, sectors, and providers. Above all, four providers pay lower wage levels. We have a care minimum wage scheme, but this ensure only the minimum basis. So if you're employed by a non-profit provider, you typically have higher wages. The next slide, please. Now, finally, I would discuss the public financing in the German scheme. Here, I would like to show you that we have had a strong increase of public costs. And this increase of public costs, here you will see the public long-term care cost as a share of GDP. You see it's an increase between 2013 and 2017. That's not only based on demographic change, it's also based on the reforms. I can see here that in Germany, long-term care or, or the long-term care insurance is, has been increasingly accepted as a relevant area of social policy. But still, we have not a very high level compared to, to the uh, uh, average of OECD countries. The next slide, please. And the, form, and the final debate we have in our insurance is about the construction. In Germany, our, our long-term care insurance is divided into two branches. We have a social insurance scheme is covered about 88% of population, and we have a man mandatory private insurance schemes with about 11% of population. Typically, the members of the private schemes have higher earnings and the lower risk of frailty. In both grade branches, stipulated by law, you have equal benefits based on care decrees. You have the same assessment procedures, but you have separate financing systems. The next slide, please. These the separate financing systems had the effect that social long-term care insurance had very often a difficult financial situation with a risk for deficits, which is based on the membership, but also on the social insurance scheme, because social insurances are always dependent on labor market developments, on the wages, because they're paid by, on the level of the wages. Our private insurances have always had a surplus. The next slide, please. Against this background, we have had a strong debate if we would have, we need a citizen insurance. This the debate we have since 2005, it was a continuing debate. It was always debated in the election campaigns and so on. But up to now we have no change, but I will show you the approaches. In this debate, we, we have three approaches, how to solve this, this problem with the split of financing systems of social and long -term, private long-term care insurance. We have three approaches. One ap approach says we have to abolish the divisions in the social and private long-term care insurance to have one insurance. Or if this does not work, the private long-term care insurance have to pay compensation payments to social long-term care insurance because they have a better situation. The first idea is that we have to consider further types of incomes because now, oh, be, because now the, the scheme is very, very dependent on the labor market development. And if you also use stock gains and rental income, you have a greater independence. 
And it's also more fair. It's also reasons for justice. Then I would like to come to some of my conclusion. Next slide, please. I started that I showed you that long-term care insurance in Germany had the basic idea of explicit familism, and it aimed to ensure a universal system to reduce the risk of impoverishment. It meant to reduce financial burdens, and it meant to strengthen care at home. Then I would like to show you what happened. The next slide, please. If I look from the past from the beneficiaries' perspectives, I said we have had a strong increase of coverage, up to 18% in 2019, which is quite high. Family care is still relevant, so about 50% people living at home are using only informal care provision. But we have an increase in use of formal or, or paid services, also about 44%. The flat rate benefits we have in place impede service, service use in home care, but also in residential care services, and the high private costs are a, a very burden above all for people with low incomes. So next slide, please. If you look at the care services, based on our quasi care market, we have an expansion of services. We have structural improvements in residential care sectors, but we have still a lack of specific offers and we have regional differences. And the strong regulations of care provision made a strong level of standardization. The next slide, please. If I look at the care workers' perspective, I see we have an expansion of the number of care workers, but we have also indicators for a difficult employment situation. If you take mini shops as a precarious employment form, for example, which is a which is a quite hard, uh, which is a, on a certain level, but here I have to say that we have regulations in place which prevent a, a wider spread of mini jobs, at least in home care, and we have also regulations related to our skill levels. If we discuss wages, we discuss the low wages, but also differences. Here we have the problems: we have no collective agreement in place, and we have huge differences in the country. And with all the problems that private households are using their own services, as I showed you, and that are typically based on precarious and gray market based jobs. If I come to the final conclusion, the next, next slide, please. Of public financing, then I can say we have had now very general acceptance that we need increasing public funds in this area. So that this insurance is, has been really, uh, really accepted as a important pillar of our social policy, but we have still this difficult division of social and mandatory private insurance schemes. Next slide, please. And so finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you offered us yet a very different model. Um, and I think the thing that struck me about that model is the mixed system, much lower levels um, of public investment, uh, a kind of quasar care market um, that's driven by customer choice, but with cost controls baked into it. Uh, and I think there's something very interesting for us to reflect on um, about a model whereby both entitlements, but also public funding has increased incrementally in response to public consent about the new system. Um, and I think it opens a question of, do you go big bang and you try to get to that sort of Sweden type model really quickly, or is there something about an evolution uh, that potentially uh, one bakes into uh, the approach to designing the system? Lots and lots for us to uh, chew on there. Thank you all so much for your fantastic contributions. Uh, we've already got questions coming in. I'd encourage uh, colleagues to put questions in the Q&A or the chat um, so that we can um, hopefully create a bit of time to respond to some of those. Um, the first set of questions I'm going to throw at our panelists. Um, first, uh, Naoki, uh, a question uh, for you. Is there a stigma about accessing care in Japan? Um, Marta, uh, a question for you. What impact did outsourcing some care services to the private and voluntary uh, providers in Sweden over the last 30 years have on service cost, on quality and on staff? Um, and uh, and uh, Hildegard, a question uh, for you. Tell us about the role of migrant care workers 
in the care system in Germany. Um, and then I'd also ask all three of you to reflect on um, a couple of general questions that have been uh, thrown at us. Uh, firstly, is the crisis in social care actually a crisis in community? Um, is, the, is, is there only the real solution to this about a huge um, upstream investment in community assets? Uh, so we're trying to plug the problem downstream where we should be trying to deal with the problem upstream. Um, and how do disabled people fit into the models of, of long-term care described uh, in the three countries? So let's uh, start there, lots for us to chew on, and then we'll take some more questions. Um, and let's start uh, in the order that we went uh, uh, with Naoki starting. Well, there used to be a stigma to accessing services by the so social service department, but there's no more stigma because the reason is that people are paying social long-term care insurance premiums. And since we are paying a special social, uh, social long-term care insurance premium, the people think they have a right to service. So if you have a right to service, there's no longer stigma to using services. And I think you over rely on the public model for getting investment, um, more money into the long-term care system. If people are given entitlement to purchase the services, the private sector will come in and start delivering the service. So pay, if you pay, give money, or, or it, it, you're not actually given the money, it is your right to purchase the service. It's like a voucher. You're giving this voucher. Once people have these vouchers, then the private sector will come in and say, we want your vouchers. So uh, the, that's how the, the increasing, making it an entitlement and giving vouchers expands the market much more rapidly than relying on government budgets because government budgets can only increase incrementally. But uh, if you give people vouchers, then people will spend all their vouchers. And unlike Germany, where you can use, you can have cash benefits, use the money to do it yourself uh, or within the family, uh, you give it to your family member. In Japan, it must be all for foremost. So all that voucher money is in, is in, is being taken care of by the market. And just one more point. I think it's, uh, what we learned in Japan is that first we originally had this dichotomy between institutional care and community care. But once people in residential homes are given uh, the difference between a special housing for elders and residential homes and nursing homes, these differences disappear because once people are given vouchers, then uh, they, they can purchase the service. But they, it, it is not part of the benefit, is the uh, hotel services, accommodations and meals. These are not part of the benefits. And I think this distinction to be made between service benefits and the hotel service benefits. Brilliant. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, and, and to the question about uh, specifically working age disabled people, how do they fit into the model um, in Japan? Uh, excuse me? Uh, so a question that asked us, how do working age disabled people fit into the model described? Uh, well, if we have this obsession about focusing on elders. So people over 40 can be part of this system, but only if they have a 
the disability is due to an age-related disease like strokes, diabetes, or Alzheimer's, not if they have a traffic accident. And the premiums are only paid for those people 40 and over, because all 40 is about the age when your parents will be needing long-term care. So instead of contributing in, in services for your parents, you, you are paying premiums, so that gives you a right to ask for services for your parents. So that's how the thinking started. Because in any country, 80 to 90% of long-term care services are for the elderly anyway. So, uh, and, and if you want to worry about the disability of work, working age people, that's an, another program because there needs to be things like job training, for example. <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, evidence of pension of age, that's a different issue. Uh, and uh, that, that's a rationale in Japan. Thank you. Um, Marta, can I turn to you? So the impact of outsourcing, uh, but also actually how does the Swedish model account for working age dis disabled people? Um, and if you can, this question about community assets, are we focusing on the wrong thing? Okay, I'll start with the, with the I'll start where, where we just ended. So the pe people with disabilities, younger people with disabilities. We have two pieces of legislation. We have the Social Services Act that covers uh, services including home care and residential care for all age groups. Okay. So it doesn't matter by age, but those services are mainly used by older people, just, we just heard. And then we have a Disability Act, the uh, Disability Service Act, which is more generous in, in, in the ambition level. So if you look at how much money is spent, uh, or public money is spent on, on um, care services, you have 2.6% of the GDP spent on care for older people and 1.3% spent on services for younger disabled people, which is a much smaller group. So we have a, we have a, a, a more generous system for people, younger people with disabilities and they don't pay any use fees at all for their services. So it's also part of, of a stronger compensation. So we have a, we have a very generous scheme of uh, personal assistance, which actually, interestingly enough, uh, have been real, um, on my, very much on the agenda because it has been abused by criminals. So, so it's way or, or because it's so generous. So you, if you can invent a person with a disability and set up a personal assistance scheme around that person, you can you can earn a lot of money. That's so it's part of, of, a, of a system that is actually for the moment we're talking about welfare crimes. So this is something that is threatening the public support for a system, of course, and we can see uh, that happening also partly in the home care services where you where you are where criminals actually have entered, which actually leads to this the other question about marketization and outsourcing. What happened with with quality of uh, what happened with cost, quality, and and staff? So what happened when when services when it became possible for local authorities to outsource services to private for profit providers? Uh, the cost didn't. Uh, it, it, it was introduced with, with, the com, with, with the promises that it would de decrease the cost and increase the quality. And in the very beginning, it actually decreased the cost because they were competing with quality and cost. So, so the lower cost, the lower quality, and that therefore is also stopped fairly soon. So it's no, no longer actually a cost competition. So it hasn't, it, so it hasn't decreased the cost. It hasn't increase the quality. I think we could agree on that. Uh, what, what happened is it's not that it's a huge difference in quality between public and privately provided services, but it is lower staffing in, in for-profit care homes. It, they also have more care workers without formal training. They also have uh, somewhat lower pay, but uh, it's not so that it's a huge difference. I think we can see that in several countries where it's more regulated, but what happened is that the entire system has changed because uh, because of the need to control once once profit motive is introduced you need to control that it's not abused the system so therefore it has increased the detailed pre-regulation of home care for instance so it it is make it more more difficult for care workers to actually adapt to the 
individual person's needs and changes in, in the very moment when you provide the care. So that is what mainly has happened. And it's also has actually happened something with the willingness to pay tax because we know that the that profit is brought out of country. So because these, these large corporations that are active, particularly in, in care homes, they're based in tax havens. So there is some, so, so, so we say, yes, we need to, to increase the tax base so we can, we can provide more, more money to the services. But then you have this problem that money then is brought out of the country or, but, or used for profit in general. So that happens. So it, it happens, something happens with people's willingness to pay for service when you, are, you have this sort of, where does the money go? Does it really go to the care or does it go up to, 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 the, to profit? So that is what happened. But we haven't seen huge quality differences in, 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 in private and, and, and public. I, I think I have to say that. Uh, yeah. And I'm not a question about um, uh, the community. So please, please, could you please repeat it? Uh, so is uh, the crisis in social care actually a crisis in community? Uh, is uh, the only real solution huge investment in upstream in strengthening community assets? Uh, so, you know, building the social capital, building some of the infrastructure um, that, that allows uh, people to be cared for within the community without the need to create formalized services. I don't think so. I think, I mean, we, we live longer with diseases now. So we have a long period before we die where we have need, where we need large amounts of care. And I can, and also because we know, we know at least from a Swedish context that you don't want to be cared for, particular, particular personal physical care. You don't want to be cared for, for by family. You want to be cared for by professionals. So I think we can't avoid care homes. I think we need even more care homes and they are good places to be, to live and die uh, and that is what we know that people want but um, i guess that is also part what what norms that are in a society but norms can change if, if there are high quality accessible attractive services then people will choose them so i think these things are real. but i can't see a situation where people with large care needs can be can stay at home without a very high cost for their for their family members and actually also for the for people people we have a large discussion for the moment is when the people are who live at home uh, are feel unsafe and their families are feeling unsafe and and once you get a p possibility to move into a care home you all you feel safer and less alone also great Thank you very much. And then a sort of final um, bucket of question for you, um, Hildegard. Uh, tell us about uh, both the role of migrant care workers, um, but also there's a related question which is more uh, wider um, about workers um, in other systems um, and uh, the extent to which there is required training um, and certification. And if you can both reflect on the German system, but potentially the uh, Swedish system as well, because I know that you work across many systems. Okay, when I start with the migrant care work, it's it's we have a, had a strong involvement of migrant care workers, and we have the involvement in different yeah settings, and we have uh, had an involvement of migrant care workers within the professional care infrastructure, so home care, and, but mainly residential care services. Here we have it's, it's, it's often based on international recruitment, but here you see that. If, if I compare the different settings, migrant care workers are typically skilled and have typically a better situation, at least in home care. It's more difficult in residential care, but in home care, it's better. But then we have migrant care workers involved in our private household, and that's very precarious. As I told you before, that it's not much, there are regulations, but they are not used typically. Yeah? And then we have, so we have a lot of migrant care workers on very precarious care, care situations in, in, within our private households. Mm -hmm. So if you take the live-in uh, situation, as a live-in care work, it's almost only done by migrant care workers from East European countries. If you take house-oriented services, then we have also German nationals with low education, educational levels. So they also are active in this area, but also migrants. So we have introduced a new scheme uh, but it's all only based on mini jobs, so it's not a good scheme, it's a precarious scheme. And here we see that only since 2011, migrant care workers have more access now to this scheme because they have the right. Uh, in Germany, since 2011, I have to say that all 
residents from Eastern European countries have the right to take up employment in the German labor market. So this has really changed something for this group, but it has nothing changed for the living care workers. So they're still employed in very difficult situations. So we have these three sectors. If I take the care workers and training, I say we have an emphasis in Germany on the three years occupational training. That's our our idea on what's, what's a good training. But if I showed you, it's based on regulations. It's about half of care workers have, having, having completed such training programs and half care workers did not uh, complete the, these programs. And at the moment we discuss changing the personal ratio in, long, in residential care, so in home nursing, in nursing homes. So we will get more personal as it planned, but we will get more assistant care elder care workers. And this means that we will have a reduction of the, of the training levels in this area. So we have a big debate on this, on this issue at the moment. So the, this is based on regulations in, in our sector. So we had, we, we had long time until August this year set uh, a law which stipulate a quota in home nursing about 50% have to, have to, of care workers have to complete it, this free occupation training scheme and within home care, home nursing, home home care, we have regulations related to type of activities. So we, we have strict regulations which type of activities you could conduct based on which on which level of training. So we have this, but we have still in progress in this area. But I can say regulations are important. Also take mini jobs in Germany. So we have most mini jobs in home care. But here we have um, regulations on regional levels that a share of, of mini jobs in home care has, ca cannot exceed 20%. So it's not, yes, the providers are not able to, Im to employ more. So I would say it's important, the regulations are very important in, in this sector, not only if you have a universal system, also if you have really employment regulations in the sector in place. Then about Perhaps finally, uh, disabled people, I think it's uh, younger, it's the same uh, like in Sweden. We have an own piece of legislation and it's more generous than, than our long-term care system for older adults, I can say it. Um, what, and as a community base, as a community idea, it's a strong idea in Germany. I showed you as in, at the beginning that we have a, our reforms, and most recent reforms were related to, to the community side to increase services that people could stay at home. So we had a strong, strong emphasis on this. And we have also an emphasis to use voluntary work in, in, in home care so to, to support people living at home, but it's very controversial. It's mainly used, we're mainly using paid voluntary work. And this can be a, a, a type of precarious low, low pay care work. <laughs> so we are, it's a very controversial situation in this area in Germany. Brilliant. Thank, thank, thank you all for your um, fantastic contributions. Um, I think for colleagues that have been uh, listening with no doubt great interest, um, really keen for you to have the space to share your reflections, your thoughts, your insights with each other. So we're going to break out into um, some breakout tables. Um, the, uh, I'll allow my colleagues to do the technology. What I'd say is that you're going to be sat with uh, six or seven other people um, on uh, the call. If you want to move to another table because there's uh, someone that you recognize or uh, that you're interested in the tape that they are likely to put, then just double click um, uh, and uh, that will move you on to um, another table. If you have any problems, uh, drop, a, drop a message in the chat and one of my colleagues uh, will help you. I think two big questions for you. Uh, what are your overall reflections on what you've heard um, in terms of systems in other countries? Does any one of these systems strike you as being particularly applicable uh, to the UK context? Um, are there a blend of some of the things that we've seen and heard from other countries that we might want to think about um, in the UK context? Um, so really interested to hear some of the reflections that come out of this. We'll have a little bit of time at the end um, in order uh, for me to sort of pick on a few people to give some general reflections um, and some insights based on your discussion, but look forward to seeing you uh, on the other side.